Good morning, church. I want you to finish these sayings with me. Money doesn't grow on trees. A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. A penny saved is a penny earned. It's an old school one. What about a fool and his money is soon separated or soon parted? All that glitters is not gold. It's interesting, isn't it, when we think of so many of these sayings are to try and help people understand um, what, what value, what cost something has. The idea of what it is to, to earn something, to save something, to, to be rewarded or to be wise with our efforts or our finances. All that glitters is not gold. Everything that's glitters, sometimes there's a cost involved. Sometimes it's, it's not all that it's meant to be. There's all sorts of sayings that we see in society that talk about the cost of something. And one of the things that I love about the reverse Advent calendar, which our church is heavily supporting at the moment, is that it goes against this idea of, of gifts being received and turns that all around so that there is a cost in giving to somebody or something else. If you picture your children, for those that, that have kids, in this scenario, kids at Christmas time, what am I going to get? What am I going to get? The excitement of, of the Christmas tree and the presents that are underneath it and all, all, that, all the stuff that goes with Christmas and the gifts. I love that households, because of the, the RAC, the Reverse Advent Calendar Program, because of that, there are so many households that are about to start this process of rather than receiving, that are wanting to give and pay a cost to give a gift to somebody else out of love and generosity. There's a cost involved, of course, with the reverse advent calendar. There's a cost that, that will involve financial, as people give, a thought of what are you going to place in that, but also time, especially those with kids, the conversation around why we do what we do when we give and what we're giving it to and helping them understand that God gave to us first through his son. But today as we come closer to Christmas in our series, Christmas is Coming, I want you to know that, that there is a cost involved in Christmas. There was a cost involved in the very first Christmas. There was also a gift. And today as we, we look at Scripture, I want us to understand what it costs at Christmas time. Why is Christmas so important? And why we need to focus on that. So before we do, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray today as we look at what it costs both for us at Christmas time, but also you. I pray that we would be focused on the person of Jesus Christ, on what he did for us. And I pray that you would speak to our very heart of hearts, to our very core today, in what we need to reflect upon in ourselves. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A number of years ago, my eldest son was, was quite young, and we de uh, he decided with his pocket money and some of the things that he'd earned, some of his, his earnings and some gifts that had been given financially, he was going to buy a drone, one of those four propellered helicopters. And, and he decided to buy this drone, and, and he'd saved really hard, and he could have bought one in the shop. He could have just bought one off the shelf. But as we looked, and Yvette and I wanted him to understand the cost of buying something and the cost of researching and taking time and a bit of patience, and we found a much better drone online. And so he decided, yes, I want to buy the better drone. I'm going to buy it online, but it needs to be shipped from overseas. And it was going to be shipped between, it was going to arrive in between 30 and 50 days. And so Rylan patiently puts through the order, and as a young boy, between 30 and 50 days, waited every single day. Is it here yet? Is it here yet? Is it here yet? To the very letter of the posting description on the, the purchase, on the 50th day, it arrived. Super excitement. He'd paid the cost. He'd been patient. He'd paid the cost of time and of finances. And finally, he opens up the box puts it in the backyard, goes to fire up the, the, the blades and, and take this thing off the ground, and only three of the four propellers worked. One was broken. 
back and forth with the, the, the place that we purchased off and took videos and photos and all that stuff, and they, they sent out a new unit for Ryland. Another 50 days. Finally, after 100 days of waiting, this, this toy, this box arrives, and the excitement, he has paid the price twice over in time and, and financially, his patience, and it's finally here. He, he gets the drone. All four propellers work. He flies it around inside for a little bit, and then we thought, oh, we'll take it outside where we can do a little bit more. And it was a very windy day, but we thought if we keep it nice and low, that'll be all, all okay. Don't go too high with it. And it's, a good, it's an okay drone, and, and so it's able to, to manoeuvre in a little bit of wind. And so he, dry, he flies this thing around, and he's exploring the backyard with his drone. He's all excited, and it's all going really well. All of a sudden, the drone goes a little bit high and goes over the fence into the next-door neighbour's yard. And at that time, our next-door neighbour had a swimming pool in their yard. Now, out of, out of re, reflex, and I can't remember if Ryland did it or I did it, but all I remember is it's like, both of us were like, get it up, get it up, the swimming pool, get it up. And up goes this drone into the sky, only to be caught by tremendous wind. And the drone just went up and up. And I remember standing there with Ryland, just in shock, going, ah. And, and I remember grabbing the controls off Ryland to, to see if I could, could maneuver it back down, but it wouldn't move, it wouldn't do anything. It's out of, it's, it's just remembered the last thing that we told it to do, which was just to go up. And, and handing the controls to Ryland and calling out for a vet, Yvette's jumped in the car and got all the kids in the car. Meanwhile, I am ru I'm running after this drone that's shooting off into the sunset and chasing it down the street with everything I've got, chasing this little black like dot thing that's just taking off. And, and finally, I, it's, there's this forest area reserve that it's all bush and walking tracks and stuff where we used to live and and now I'm running through scrub and bracken fern and trying to to get to chase this thing and it was gone you've it pulled up in the cars everyone's upset and the drone we just stood there and watched this little black bit go off into the distance until all of a sudden the clouds kind of consumed it and we it was gone at night time on a clear night, when you look up at the sky and you see a little light flying through the sky, it may be a satellite, but chances are it's that drone still going around the earth. It, it <laughs> gone once and for all. The uh, very next day, <laughs> Yvette and I went and bought Ryland a drone <laughs> and gave one to him as a gift. We, it, it wasn't the same. It wasn't as good, but it was something. You see, Ryland paid a cost. The entire family paid an emotional cost. There was something that he had worked towards. He didn't earn that, but, but he had earned the, the experience of having something. He'd paid for it. He'd, he'd worked hard in his patience. He'd worked hard in his finances to, to get this toy. And, and it's very much the same in life. We work hard towards things. We don't deserve the bad things sometimes, but sometimes we do. You think of a relationship with somebody. If you treat somebody right in a relational sense, you care for them, you give them time, you have conversations, you, you, you love on them, you're generous with them, then that relationship will be elevated. If you treat somebody poorly and you don't respect them and you don't, don't look after them, don't spend time with them, and, and even by your words you, or your actions, you may be abusive to them by, by not caring for them the way you should, then that relationship... You've earned something in that relationship. You see, the, the Bible has a lot to say about what you earn and what you have. In Genesis chapter 3, it says, By the sweat of your brow, verse 19, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken, and to the dust you, are, you will return. And it's saying that by the sweat of your brow, you need to work to earn something, there is a cost. And that cost is you work and the receivement that, that you get from that is food. And today we, we see that's it's very much the, the same. Like Romans 4, chapter 4 says, Now to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. And so you, you get a job, you, you talk to the employer and you negotiate a wage and the hours and the salary and the, the, those things and you go, well, I will work this much time for this task and you will give me this much money and, 
and, and you, fair day's work for a fair day's pay, and, and it's not a gift. You don't work really hard, and then, oh, here's a gift. It's like, no, you've earned that. You've, you've worked hard towards something, and now you've earned those things. Now, much like a relationship, you can earn to have a good relationship, or you can earn to have a, a, a poor relationship, depending on how you treat people. There's a cost involved, and the way that you pay that cost, maybe the cost of treating someone well is a good relationship. The cost of treating someone poorly is a bad relationship. But I want us to know that as we look to Christmas, each and every one of us have a relationship with a loving God. Now, that's regardless of where we are in our journey or what you believe. But we have a relationship with a loving God. Some of us treat God well. Some of us haven't treated God well. The sad part is that, that God is, is perfect, absolutely perfect, and you cannot put anything imperfect with perfect. It, you, it ruins the perfect. If you take a nice bottle of uh, some water, a bowl of water that's perfect, and you add one drop of food dye, it penetrates the whole bowl of water. It changes everything. And like that, God who is perfect can't have anything that is bad or wrong or evil be a part of that. And so what we see is that, that our actions, the cost of what we've done, the wages of how we have lived, there is a consequence. And what we have earned, what we have worked towards when we, we damage our relationship with God is a punishment. And that punishment is death. An eternity without God, an eternity without being in the presence of our Creator. That's what we have earned by not following what God has called us to do. And every single person, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. For the wages of sin is death. We have all fallen short of what God has for us. However, God offers a gift. And we see that, that, that while we've done the wrong thing, God offers us an incredible gift. We don't deserve it. We haven't earned it, but he offers a gift. And the gift is for the consequence that we would bear, that that death that we would have can be substituted for something else. Exodus chapter 29 verse 10 says, Bring the bull in front of the tent of meeting, and Aaron and his sons shall lay their hands on its head. And this was a symbol in the Old Testament of what would take place is that, that we deserve death. We have done the wrong thing in the eyes of God. And because he is perfect, our imperfection now can't be with him. So he's offered this gift of an animal. And they would lay their hands on the, the head of the animal. And what that, that was a symbol of is that your sins, the things that you have done wrong, will be transferred to that animal. The things that you have done wrong are now on that animal and that animal then would be sacrificed in your place. And the death would take place on the animal and not you. What you deserve was transferred. We, we see in Leviticus chapter 1, verse 4, you are to lay your hands on the head of the burnt offering and it will be accepted on your behalf and make, to make atonement for you. The atonement to make right in God's eyes. And so because of the gift of, of, of a, a scapegoat, which is, which is a bit different in the Jewish tradition, but because of the gift, the sacrifice, you are able to transfer what you rightly deserved onto an animal so that you were atoned for. You were made right in your relationship with God where what you've earned was a sacrifice. God had it's given us a, a set of rules to live by, and they're not legalistic rules because we know that, that you know, we're called to love God and love others. That's the simplicity in Jesus' summary of all the commandments and all the rules. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength and love your neighbour as yourself. But we see that God does give us some, some guidelines to live, live by. In the Old Testament, they're called the commandments. And, and we know with commandments, they're, rules and guidelines are not there to, to hurt people but to help people. We would say to our kids, if you put a guard around the fireplace, don't touch the fireplace. Now, you're not trying to be legalistic and suck the fun out of life and hurting anybody. You're, out of love, you put a rule and a boundary there to protect your children from, from burning themselves because that's a terrible thing. It's a boundary put out of love, not put out of trying to, to ruin people's lives. And so likewise, God has placed these commandments in place for us to live by. 
these guidelines to lovingly help us navigate life. And when we look at them and we understand them, we go, well, of course, they're not there out of malice or or harshness. They're there out of love. The summary of the Ten Commandments found in Exodus chapter 20 go like this. You shall have no other gods but me, the first commandment. You shall make for yourself, you not you shall not make for yourself any idol, nor bow down and worship it. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. You shall remember the Sabbath to keep the Sabbath day holy. Respect your father and mother. You must not commit murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not give false evidence against your neighbor. You must not be envious of your neighbor's goods. You shall not be envious of his house or his wife, nor anything that belongs to your neighbor. These ten commandments are to help us live a whole life. Lying and stealing, we know are bad. These, these guidelines for life, these commandments for life are to help us to have life to the full. So let's see what these commandments look like personally if we go through them one by one. Firstly, you shall have no other gods but me. Now remember, God is perfect, so you can't slip up ever. One slip up is enough to earn a separation from God, from perfection. You shall have no other gods but me. Have you ever put anything in the place of God? Have you ever thought something was greater than God? Have you ever let your mind wander from that place of where God is number one above all things? I know times when my kids were little and and even now, there's times when my family becomes elevated above God. They're my number one priority. Oops. Um, Oops. God should have been first. Oops. Maybe you've worshipped something other than God, a job, a sports team, a celebrity. The second commandment goes well with this. It says, you shall not make any idols. The the direct verse says, "Of, of any material on earth and of any image of earth. Why would you try and restrain the creator of the material and of the created animals by making an image of an animal with the material that he created? Like, you can't limit God to that. You shall not make yourself any idols or bow down and worship it. Have you ever made it, had an idol of something other than God, a possession that you thought a bit too much of or a bit too close to, that you would never, ever get rid of? What's behind that? Maybe a person, a celebrity, maybe a sports team that you've made sacrifices in life more than you should have and placed it in the place of God and made an idol out of it. The third commandment, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Have you ever said God's name in vain? Have you ever said the names of God or Jesus or the Christ in a way that was, was not honouring of who he is? What about a conversation about the church, his bride? Have you ever said a conversation about the church should, or I wish the church, or the church, and you spoke badly about God's church? Are you misusing God's name, the thing that he died for, the body of Christ? You shall remember and keep the Sabbath day holy. Have you ever missed a Sunday going to church? I know I have. Have you ever not done purely holy things or had a a day of rest on the Sabbath? More contemporary or a bit more um, 2020, have you ever looked at the church through the camera or through the, the screen, I'm looking at the camera, and thought, oh, this, I wish they would just, oh, it's not that good, and been actually critical of what the church is doing. We do it as a staff every week as we review the Sunday and the, the attempt to, to, to love the congregation better and do better with what we've got. And it's really hard. What is critical? What is loving? Are we keeping the Sabbath day holy? What is in our heart of hearts when we make those comments? Respect your father and your mother, fifth commandment. Ever disrespected your parents? 
Number six, you must not commit murder. Number seven, you must not commit adultery. Number eight, you must not steal. I remember a high-profile person within the life of our, uh, our city, meeting them at a cafe. I was meeting with somebody else and, and I hadn't seen them for a while. I said, oh, would, would you like to catch up? They were sitting by themselves and say, are you busy or could we join you? I thought, great, so join them for lunch. We sat down and had a great conversation. They went up and left and went back to work and, like I said, quite a prominent person within the city of Ballarat. And when we went to pay, the, the people at the restaurant said, oh, are you paying for that person as well? They'd just simply forgotten to pay. They were so used to paying when you ordered that they forgot to pay at the end of the meal, up and left. In effect, it's stealing. It's an innocent mistake, but it's still stealing. We happily dobbed them in and called the police and had them, no, we um, paid for their meal. It was all good. <laughs> Have you ever given false evidence like I just did then about what I did with that person? Yes, we've done, yes. Um, that was number nine. Number ten, you must not be envious of your neighbor's goods. You shall not be envious of his house or his wife or anyone that belongs to your neighbor. Have you ever saw something and wanted it and lusted over that thing, either a person or a possession? When we go through these 10 commandments, these 10 rules for life, and we really truly look at ourselves in our hearts of hearts, for most people, for most people, and of course there is exceptions, but for most of us, we realize that we have failed in all but two. Eight of those guidelines, eight of those commandments, we have failed not once but commonly, often, over and over again. Even in the name of a joke, I did one then when I gave false testimony for the sake of a laugh and a joke. It is so, we, we fail time and time again. There's two that most people haven't failed, and that is that you must not commit murder and you must not commit adultery. Now, of course, this isn't new. This has been around forever, and Jesus knew this. He knew that, that everybody... All of humanity, all of creation, we have failed all but two. And so Jesus speaks into this idea of, of right living. And how do we make ourselves right in our relationship with God? And how does this work? And so Jesus singles out the two things, the, the two that, that we could possibly hang on to and go, oh, we're okay in this area. And he says this. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 21, Jesus says, You have heard it, that it was said that people from people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who does murder will be subject to punishment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry, anyone who is angry with your brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Anyone who says to his brother or sister, Raka, which is like an, an anger, it's like, ah, oh, I'm so frustrated, angry, I, I despise you is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in the dangers of the fire of hell. She says, you don't have to murder someone. If you are angry with someone in your heart of hearts, like truly angry with them, then you have committed murder. Then you are subject to, to judgment. The wage, what you have earned in that emotion, in that outlet, in that focus, is death. He goes on to say in Matthew chapter 5, verse 27, You have heard that it was said, You shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. You don't have to do the physical act of adultery. You just have to look lustfully in your heart of hearts at somebody. And if you live... In the Western world, you walk down any street or if you look at any ad or if you look at any internet or if you, you look at any bus, you'll see images that are just designed for us to lust over. They're designed to help us slip up. They're designed to, to make us want something that, that's not ours. And over and over again, Jesus said, if you look at someone lustfully, then that's enough in your heart of hearts. To, you've committed adultery in your heart. What Jesus is saying by singling out these, go, these two commandments, he's saying, do you know what? Every single person has failed all ten. 
Every single one of us, in our attitudes, in our emotion, we have failed on every single account. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. What you have earned by breaking the relationship, what you have earned by not following the guidelines, what you have earned in your relationship with God is death, separation from God for all eternity. But the passage goes on. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. The wages of sin, what you have earned is death, but God offers a gift. You don't deserve it. You haven't earned it. It is a gift, a gift that was given with a huge cost on God's behalf. As God gave his only begotten son to earth to grow up in in humble beginnings, to live this perfect life, never once failing his relationship with God, keeping the commandments and guidelines that God laid down so that he who was perfect could could become the sacrifice for us. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him, him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. He who had no sin, Jesus who had done nothing wrong to damage his relationship with God, became the the. The, the scapegoat became the transference, like we read in the Old Testament, of, of the representation of the things that we have done wrong were passed on to the sacrifice in our place so we could be atoned for, we could be restored, not because of anything that we had done. We deserved death, but we were given a gift in Jesus. And when we come before him and we repent, we say sorry for the things that we've done wrong. We transfer all of those wrongdoings onto Jesus. He who became sin for us so that we might become righteous before our Lord God. Today I want to ask a question of us. As a church, as we come before God, you realize that there was a cost involved in Christmas. There was a cost as God the Creator humbled Himself, His Son at His right hand came down to earth. All of His glory and splendor and power, He came in human form and lived with the pressures and and the things that we fail at every single day. And as He lived and wrestled through life, not doing the wrong things but always choosing what was right, He died a horrible death on the cross for you and me in our place, taking what we deserved onto himself, a gift freely given out of love for us. Because of this, we have the opportunity to be restored before God. I believe that being restored isn't enough. We need to be continually restored, renewed as disciples, becoming like Jesus, as his apprentices, as we learn to live like Jesus, as we learn to love like Jesus, as we learn to lead the way that Jesus led the people around him. We need to be continually reformed in his image, which means each and every year as we, we, something comes to the surface, oh, there's this issue, oh, there's this thing, oh, there's this thought, we need to give that to God because Jesus died for that. We need to let him penetrate every part of our lives and every flaw we have, we give it to God. We say, Jesus, thank you so much for dying for that area of my life, dying for that thought, dying for that sin. And and if you're truly thankful, then you don't do it again. If you're truly sorry for something that you've done, then you won't do that thing again. If you're thankful, you'll act in a thankful way. If you're sorry, you, you won't do it again. You don't say sorry and do it over and over again. You've got to say sorry, accept the forgiveness, then try to do better. And yes, we're going to mess up. But that's why Jesus paid the cost once and for all. We don't need to go to the the temple and have an animal sacrificed on our behalf because Jesus was sacrificed at a tremendous cost for you and for me. The question today is, will you accept the gift? I'm going to say a prayer, and if you want to repeat the words in your heart, you can also accept the gift 
But in this prayer, if you just want to pray your own prayer alongside it, I'm also going to give an opportunity for us as the church to offer areas of our life, maybe of those commandments or maybe a different area that we realize Jesus died for and we haven't changed. So truly, we're not sorry. And if we're not sorry, are we really accepting the gift in its fullness? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you sent an incredible gift. Lord, and you paid an incredible price for us to be saved. Lord, we accept you as our Lord and Savior today. As we say sorry for the things that we have done wrong, may we turn from those and head towards being the people you want us to become. Lord, you, would you refine us to be more like your son. Jesus, we accept your Holy Spirit into our hearts so that we may be guided through the decisions of life to love people the way they need to be loved. And Lord, we pray for those that have had something stir in their hearts today, that you wouldn't just bring it to the surface, but you would bring that to the cross. Lord, your son died for that sin. Your son died for that mistake. Lord, your son took the consequences of that onto himself. May there be a release of the burden and the weight of sin. But Lord, may there be a transformation within us as well, so that we would not go on sinning, but we would go on to become mighty men and women of God, reforming ourselves as apprentices in the likeness of Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you so much that you paid an incredible price for us. And Lord, we accept that today for the glory of you. We want to live that out each and every day to honour you. In your name we pray. Amen.